welcome to Deconstructing History, the podcast where we talk about all things living history and reenacting. I am your host, Mike Baker. In today's episode, we're going to continue talking to our esteemed panel of guests. And today we're going to talk about some things such as hurdles in reenacting, as well as sort of dream projects that each person wants to do. And just to recap, on our panel today, we have Nadim Ahmad from Eran Ud Turan. We have Matt Blazik from the Agincourt Soldier. And we have Ari from the Turnip of Terror, as well as the How to Medieval uh, podcast with Matt. We also have Caroline Bigelow and Andy Volpe from Lego 3 Karanaika. And so on to our questions and our panel. So what might be some of the hurdles or issues that you face as a reenactor? Um, well, definitely. Um, I've kind of already talked about some of the, you know, this lack of primary sources. They just didn't write about women very much. There weren't very many female authors and writers, at least that we have today. Um, so we're left with mostly secondary sources. Um, and then there's just that kind of general sense of the primary sources that we have, or even some of the secondary sources, um, neoclassical era, especially for Roman stuff, is the over-sexualization of women. Were the common women of Rome dressed exactly like neoclassical artists portray them? Probably not. They didn't go around with very little clothing or see-through garments. Um, and it's it's makes it kind of difficult to sort through some of those things. Um, now, you will see portrayals of, uh, especially Pompeii is a, and Herculaneum are fantastic resources for paintings of women um, you know, and mosaics just because they show the more um, middle and upper classes of women. They have portraits, you know, of what they look like or more of an idealized portrait of them in life. Romans showed the warts and all, or they were more prone to it than a lot of other ancient cultures. They didn't see themselves as perfect. They didn't see their gods as being perfect. So they were a little less afraid of showing flaws. And, you know, if somebody had a huge something on their face or their neck or their arms, that usually was put into the portrait. And the Romans were fine with that because it was more realistic, I guess. Um, but there's not a whole lot of fine detail that's left these 2000 years. So kind of sorting through that. Um, and then the women that were wrote, you know, written about, that they wrote about at those times were upper class women. So members of the imperial family or um, at least the upper classes of society, or they were women of the night or they were goddesses or mythological figures, which those aren't incredibly helpful unless that's what you want to portray. If you want to portray a goddess, by all means, you know, look to what the Romans idealized um, Diana to be. And it's going to also depend on a lot of different contexts. So, you know, were you um, a Roman Briton? Were you living in Egypt? Were you living in Syria? Were you in Northern Africa? Were you in Italy? You know, where were you? Um, which other gods and goddesses would you go to, you know, for mixing with your own local gods? Um, so there's a lot of issues in that respect as well. And just so many, I mean, it's not so prevalent now, but when I was first starting, a lot of the, not Roman reenactors, but some of the other ancient world and um, not quite modern world reenactors would look at me and say, ha, huh, Roman women didn't have so much clothing on. How do you know? Like, were you in ancient Rome? All of my sources say that they would wear things like that. Oh, well, it's not see-through enough, but I guess you can't wear that out in public. You know, it's just, it's little things like that, and they don't really know, but it doesn't fit their preconceived notions of what a Roman woman would have looked like, so they discount it. And trying to get away from some of those myths and the portrayals, especially in Hollywood, it's incredibly difficult, and that's really one of the bigger hurdles for this. It, you're, you're talking about that, and it, and one of the one of the things that popped in mind because I, I forgot about this um, until you talked about like you know the see through and the preconceived sexist notions. I remember when I when I would say like you know, I'd be like oh I'm I'm a living historian. They're like oh what period are you? And this is like around 2002 2003 when I first started. I do I say like oh I do ancient Roman, and they're like you do what now? It's like well you know Civil War and, and American Revolutionary War. Like yeah, 
It's like, well, it's that except it's ancient Rome. And they're like, what? What? And, and then you, know, you then you'd also get like, oh yeah, what times the orgy? Are? It's like it's like really. Um, so yeah, there, there there is a little bit of annoyances on on from the male perspective too. But of course, yeah, but it's not nearly as horrendous as it is on the other side. But yeah, I, I do. I kind of laugh about it. it. It was like around I don't know maybe 2010 when I kind of stopped. This is a wild guess. I wasn't hearing that anymore when I'd introduce myself as a as a Roman living historian. Um, but yeah, no, like I remember too, like in the early days, everybody's like, "Oh yeah," it's like, "Wow, you, you guys, you guys have some, uh, you guys have some issues." Reenacting in general has kind of been a quote unquote boys' club for a very long time. So when women try yeah. to go into it, it's hard to break through um, and actually be taken seriously. So many reenactors, they had you know, they may have female reenactors, but it's like the wife or the girlfriend of the reenactor who's here or the daughter. And she's just kind of there so she can hang out with whoever she's there to hang out with and look kind of appropriate. But this idea of women reenactors in their own right is fairly modern. Um, And, you know, we're held to kind of a different standard because, I mean, again, there isn't a whole lot of primary source documents. So um, the accuracy wasn't really you know picked up on i think for female reenactors we were given a lot more leeway as far as what was real and what was not real what was good what was bad um and then you know as we started to become reenactors of our own now we were able to say yes i've done the research this is more accurate than whatever you're fantasizing about and here are the reasons why so it's also an educational moment that's really come about in maybe the last 15 to 20 years so you know it's kind of new for women to be reenactors in their own right uh, some some friends of ours who do um suffragette uh like 19 was it late late 19 teens um they were at the uh plymouth uh, thanksgiving day parade um a couple years ago i think it was one of the first years that they did it and the comments that they got from some people were were horrendous and uh two of them were almost like i don't know if i want to keep doing this if, if this is the crap i'm gonna get and it, it was this weird irony too because you know they, the the way the actual suffer just got treated too it was like but you know really haven't we come far enough that we don't need to be we don't need to be lectured by pigs and it's like yeah no, i guess there's still some fighting that left to go on but it's yeah, still it's, that idea of like a fantasy, you know, as yeah. it's not really real. So it's okay to kind of pick on people like cat calls, like, oh, it doesn't mean anything yeah. because you're in a costume. Um, y- yes, <laughs> especially in the UK. Um, so I, I find that um, there, in terms of public interest um, for things that aren't Western European is, is actually pretty low. Um, and, um, you know, things that aren't, Western European history tend to be sort of exoticized and kind of all lumped together, um, which isn't particularly helpful. And and it puts up a big barrier when we're trying to interact with the public and with other reenactors. And it also makes recruitment like a nightmare because I'm trying to do something completely out there and it's hard for people to number one latch on to what it is that i'm even portraying um and then number two um, get interested enough to invest um you know invest their time and energy and money into getting kit so my i mean my main challenge has been has been in terms of booking events because in, in the uk there's an awful lot of emphasis on local history um, and there's very little attention given to international history um and in terms of getting members because um you know number one we're a small group to begin with we're a small niche group to begin with um because we focus on such a relatively obscure part of world history um but it's you know people people are very supportive of it but they won't necessarily want to do it because that you know they're not that interested in it, which is fine you know people have to be interested in, in what they are but it is a challenge for me because with a small group of you know three people <laughs> there's only so much you can do with three people let me see in 2019 I think we had had three or four events um, and they were by and large museums, um, our academic conferences, um, you know, where where um, the, the event organizer and visitors aren't really expecting, you know, big battles or, or horse riding or archery. And, you know, like they're not expecting the medieval pageantry. They're expecting, you know, a handful of people who 
you know what they're talking about, who can have an in-depth discussion and, and teach people, as opposed to, you know, just a flashy, you know, medieval um, pageantry that you get with, with some of the larger events. Yeah, uh, that's another thing I, I should mention too, and uh, Ian Laspina, um, Aaron Knight had done this on his YouTube, and there's been some others that have tried to come out and mention this too, like, uh, like the medieval period, uh, 15, I should say late medieval, you know, 15th century, we'll just go to 15th century. Um, you try to go with the visual artwork and there's tons of it. You know, that you, you're not going to find any real leather armor. So all the crap that you see in Hollywood is not going to show up. Um, so, you know, hopefully that'll de- demystify it a little bit or, or demyth bust it a little bit. But, but at the same time, you have to be really careful about what you're looking at artwork wise in what time period it was created in the context of what's be what's in the artwork. If it's a portrait, um, I think one of the best examples is the Eisenheim altarpiece from, I think it's the uh, 1430s. Um, and it's showing uh, Jesus being taken down from the, or, or uh, being resurrecting uh, from, from the grave. And there's a bunch of quote unquote Roman soldiers that are being knocked over by the, by the power cosmic or whatever you're going to call it. And they're wearing like padded jacks and hinged um, bassinets. And this is, um, is it for, uh, 1430? No, I maybe think it's a little bit later. But in either case, you know, the, the armor that's being shown is basically obsolete. Um, it's not contemporary. But then we see other things like uh, I'm doing this research with the Museum of Printing up in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Uh, we got a collection in of like 1500 prints, most of them from the 16th century, which is really cool. There's a, a piece of, with a woodblock cut, which I believe is from either from Julius Caesar or the history of Rome from Livius, printed around, I don't know, 1550s, I think. But it shows Julius Caesar charging on a, in 1550s armor against another guy with a lance. And it's like, well, you know, if you, if you didn't know anything about Julius Caesar and you're reading about this, you know, you'd assume that, oh, well, you know, this is an accurate portrayal. And hopefully today, um, other than 1550, you, know, you do about two seconds of research on, uh, on any kind of Roman history, you start to realize, well, first of all, Caesar is not a knight. Second of all, he's not jousting. Third of all, he's not wearing that armor. We don't even see that armor until 1520. So you, you kind of have to be careful about what you're looking at and when. Um, and I, again, Ian, Ian pointed that out with a lot of the manuscripts that we look at for um, late medieval period and Renaissance, where it's like, it, and like the whole thing with like the, the, the ball and chain flail, uh, the spiked ball flail, um, you know, it's, it's trope standard weapon in like movies and, and games. But the thing, you know, we do see images of it in, in the actual medieval context. But the problem is that when you look at the context, or you look at what they're portraying, it's a lot of times it's like, it's like mocking. It's, it's not the, the guy who is flailing that thing around is kind of like supposed to be the, 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 the fool or the enemy who is defeated, or he's using this primitive um, weapon that nobody really uses uh, as a, as a mockery. Um, uh, what was the other thing? Um, and we see, we see like flails and use in peasant revolts um, against knights. And it's kind of like that David and Goliath thing too. Um, we also see like really weird looking armor and weapons to represent the exotic. Um, it, it is a lot like Hollywood. And I, I do laugh at that, that weird irony that they use really wild, like badass looking armor with spikes all over it and shit and black armor. Um, you know, these are the bad guys. You know that they're bad guys because they've got these crazy ass armor and weapons. Um, it, it, it's not, it's, it, it, there's, there are many parallels, uh, with the, the period artwork. Um, and you have to be careful and that's where museums that specialize in arms and armor are so critical for your research and to try to get to a website. Hopefully they have their catalog available for online searching or they, they're open to talking with regular folks and visitors to, to like, look, I'm doing research on X, Y, Z, you know, point me in the right direction. Because you can, uh, like, with some of the time periods, which is interesting, too, because, um, all right, so, so let me skip ahead a little bit here. 17th century in Italy, you know, at the high Renaissance, there was a Romanesque style of armor that was designed to look, quote, unquote, like Roman armor. And it's heavily embossed with, like, lions and uh, on the breastplate and, like, curly cues and, like, turgis, little 
flaps on the shoulders and the skirt, um, almost edging in on that, on what comes later, like the Rococo style of all these curly cues and, and, uh, and floral patterns and stuff. And in the helmets, like the Burgundy helmets are ridiculous. Um, one of the best examples, again, is, is uh, Leonardo da Vinci, his um, silver point of um, the Condottatori, um, wearing this crazy ass helmet with like a dragon engraved on it or, or embossed on it or whatever it's supposed to be. And, you know, it's, it's not, we don't see any of that historically. You know, we, we have not found archaeologically for Romans that kind of helmet, but we do find some archaeologically for the 17th century. So, you know, we see it in artwork and we see it archaeologically, but that doesn't mean that's what the Romans were doing. It, it, you know, it, it, it's scratching the surface. But I'm, I, I feel like I'm kind of taking over the conversation. So I'll, I'll pass it on to Ari and, and we can kind of go, go from there. Well, you have a lot of interesting points and I agree with it. Effectively, context, as you explained it, is one of the biggest factors in trying to figure out how to be an interpreter and how to put together impressions. You know, it's not just manuscript art, but you also mentioned things like context is important, not just because, hey, we're depicting a biblical story, but we're putting people in contemporary garb because that's what the people would be able to understand when they look at it, because you have yep. to actually see it. But then you also even have smaller shifts that can have pretty big impacts in that just effigies are, are a huge resource for people putting together martial impressions of the late 14th, early 15th century, you know, the, the part that I, I spend most of my time working on. And they have this issue where if you didn't have your effigy carved at the time of your death, and you don't have the backstory on this effigy, you could very well be saying, okay, well, we know this person died in 1380, but if his effigy was carved in 1410, the likelihood is incredibly high that it's going to be carved by an artist who is using reference pieces that if that individual person interred didn't provide their own armor to that man for carving, there were a lot of stock. They would have suits of armor that they would use as reference for effigies, especially for people who weren't. They, they would have a, a likeness of their face, and then they would be put into a description of what their harness was. But for the actual shaping of pieces, they would go to the they go grab a, a reference piece off the shelf. If you don't know whether or not that person had the their armor specifically preserved from the time of their death and then made into their effigy, you could be 30 years off. And especially in the turn of the 15th century, 30 years can be night or day on whether or not a piece of armor is appropriate for your impression. So context is, is incredibly important. And that's why, and I don't know if it got cut off, in one of my earlier answers while my computer was, was dying, I mentioned that I came to it developing historical impressions backwards when I hit mid the medieval era after I, I left the 19th century. And I started working pretty much from the visual depictions and the anecdotal references of people that I admired. And then I scaled back from that and started looking at sources. But what I found was that when I started looking at sources while talking to people that I trusted their, their ability to interpret sources, I was able to to miss a lot of these contextual problems. Because if you go into, you know, we, we are incredibly unsupported in at least the you know, American K-12 system on really what the social context of the medieval era was. You know, it's just not, I mean, it's just not important. There's only so many things you need to teach. And so when you come into trying to understand what the sociology of a, a culture removed by half the planet and half a millennia, there's a lot of things you just don't know you don't know. And so while when you could say primary sources are the best, sure, if you understand them. And the best way to understand them without having a strong academic background, if you don't have yourself an actual degree or some formalized training in interpreting this particular culture, is to go into these sources with some guidance, kind of have someone take you under their wing and to be open and willing to have this conversation. So that would be the other side of what's the biggest hurdle that I see, what have I experienced other people have the biggest struggle with is being able to accept that you're wrong and that you don't know anything at all, really. In the 2000 movie Pollock with Ed Harris as Jackson Pollock, there's a line where an interviewer asks, when do you know when you're done painting? So similarly, when do you know when you're done a portrayal, if you're even ever done. We're not ever done. 
with a no, trail. No. And that has everything to do with one. I don't know anyone who has, I mean, I can know maybe two people who have the financial resources to effectively just one and done an impression to just say, I'm going to buy it all in one go and it'll show up in three months. And then I'm, I've got everything I need because even if you did that, you still need to replace gear that wears out. And every time you replace gear, you have the opportunity to replace it with something better, more authentic, better made, better materials. You can switch from in the medieval context, you can start switching from vegetable tan leather that's cowhide to kid skin or goat skin or pig skin, things that you'd see a lot more other alternative leather types with, but obviously you'd have to go specially have those specially made. And outside of financial resources, as we've talked about, there's always going to be something that either you, you haven't learned yet, you learned wrong when you first learned it, or that, that research has been revised behind your back in the time that you've spent since the last time you learned it. It's the whole idea behind the, you know, the, the irony of publishing is that the moment you have published your book, it's out of date <laughs> because it's static, but our knowledge base is not. Well, I don't think a betrayal is ever finished. Um, I think you're constantly, we're, we're constantly tweaking, growing, working in, I mean, history isn't static. It, it, it never stays the same. So we're constantly having to reevaluate what we know about the history we're portraying and working in that new information. So my whole idea with what I'm doing, I'm a big fan of, of, of threes, doing things in threes for some reason. So it's like I'm working on I have the Agincourt soldier portrayal. I've got the Poplin soldier portrayal. And for a few years, we're, we're thinking about adding a 1775 Knox soldier portrayal. It may not happen. I may get stuck at two. I mean, really, it's finding what your burnout point is. I mean, there's only so much, so many hours in a day, you know, finding it's like, what are you willing to let slide in one portrayal because you're working on getting the other portrayal perfect? It, do you have the capacity to do 10 portrayals? I mean, I know, I know people who do have the, the drive and the capacity. They could do 10 perfect portrayals and, and, and rock every single one of them. I, I couldn't do that. I just don't have the capacity for that. I don't think you're ever really done. Um, I know for me, me when I started reenacting, I was in my early 20s and now I'm in my early 40s. And, you know, women and people in general back then didn't replace things as often as we did. So things get holes in them and you repair them. Fashions change a little bit. You know, I've adapted what my kit looks like. I've added more shoes, just kind of the way people would do. You know, back then I've gained weight. So I've had to adjust parts of my outfit just the way people did back then. So it's, my kid has kind of evolved with me and I'll add new articles of clothing, you know, when I'm able to kind of like people back then, if they needed a new dress and they were able to afford one, or at least the material to make it, they'll get a new dress or, you know, the materials and, you know, they'll make it themselves. And their sewing ability is probably much better 10 years in the future than it was 10 years in the past. So they're, you know, getting better at what they do. And in reenacting, it's the same kind of thing. Your ability and your knowledge, they evolve and they change. So your kit's going to evolve with that. Now for a couple hypothetical sort of fantasy questions. If you can go back in time and talk to your younger reenacting self, what would you tell you about reenacting? Mm. Oh my God. I guess it depends on how far back I'd go. Am I, yeah. if, if I went back and could talk to myself when I was doing 19th century reenacting, I would remind myself that you need to maintain a hard line between your impression and yourself. Uh, I allowed, and I, this might've been a dynamic of the fact that I would I spent like 60 hours a week working there. You were in character for most of it. A lot of the times I had to spend the night on the boat and do overnight programs, but we'd actually go and do sailing programs where we'd leave and we'd be out at sea for days at a time. And I allowed my impression and who I was, my personal identity, to muddy a bit. And while I, there's, I suppose, something kind of cool about, there was a point in time where I forgot that I was a, just some 19-year-old California and not a, a sailor on a ship in the 1830s. That was, there were a lot of things that required unpacking 
after I had allowed myself to sort of muddy my personality that way. So if I could go that, that far, I would make sure to impose a hard line between who you are and who you are when you're in character. Uh, if I wanted to go back to just my medieval uh, experience, I would, I would definitely have st steered myself away from, and I, I know I get in hot water when I talk about this because there are a lot of great people in the SCA. There are a lot of great people who I, I like in the SCA and what they do in the SCA is great, but getting to where I am now, the time I spent doing stuff in the SCA in like 2013 and 2014 really distracted from what I wanted to get out of my medieval experience, but I also don't think it contributed any to how I now currently see my journey and the, the way forward and the things I want to get out of it. I, I think that it was a kind of a speed bump and it distracted me because what I want now and what kind of what I was going for when, before I got involved in the SCA, like really involved, not tangentially involved was, is the same before and after the middle bit is where everything kind of went off the rails. And so th those are the two things, I, depending on how far back I went are, are the two advices I give myself. And I, yeah, I would, I would spend less time in the SCA and more time in independent living history. And I would try and save myself some you know, psychological damage by imposing a hard line between myself and my impression. Um, for me, um, I, I think like when I, if I was to go back when I first started doing that stuff is to, yeah, is that really hard balance of not wanting to burn, not wanting to shoot down the, the enthusiasm and the desire to, to spill all knowledge that you've learned um, to the audience. And in, in, in specifically those contexts of like the public, like arms and armor programs, like at Higgins, um, I would go through like in, in 30 minutes or less, like 400 years of Roman history or, or, you know, whatever, and just nonstop talking. And uh, there was so many like deer in the headlights in the audience. I, I if I was to go back, I'd kind of like gently tug back and say, well, yeah, hold on. Try to think about, try to figure out what the audience is interested in. Um, and, you know, over the years, I think, I think it probably took me about seven years of doing these programs and continually researching them as I was doing it and revising as they went. Um, you know, you, you could ask when I, when I go to schools, like I ask them, it's like, you can ask me anything. Um, you know, nothing is off the table. There's no stupid uh, question. And, and I like that because it, it, makes my brain work, you know, cause, cause kids will come up with some really great questions and it'd be like, well, and, and also that, that confidence in saying, I don't know, or we don't know what's going on. Um, and I'm trying to do a lot more now of trying to incorporate a little bit of the archeology span in the sense that uh, at least interpretation of evidence saying like, well, we, we found this object. We think it dates between here and here. And that's all we have. Um, we think it, it's a part of this armor. Um, what do you guys think? You know, what do you kids think? You know, what's the first thing that pops in your head when you look at something like this? Um, or it could be something like, so, so we have this object and now, and then a couple of years later, we found this document that mentions something that sounds like this object. And then we find a piece of artwork that seems to show it in use. So, all right, now we've got all three and do those things line up with each other? You know, so it can be, it can be really good thought process for, for kids um, to, to, in abstract thinking. Um, but anyway, I kind of kind of ratchet back to the original tract here was that, um, you know, the, the audience does not necessarily care about on this date at this time in this battle that you may not have ever heard of before. Um, this happened and it was critical. Um, they're, they're not necessarily going to remember. They're not, they, they don't have um, they, they don't have the context of why. You know, why is that relevant? Um so it's, it's also about being upfront and honest with the public, like right away, um, into your, like, like in your introduction or like in your, in your regular pattern, like if you got the, the cassette tape in your head playing on side A, you know, every time you flip to the front and you start again, um, the repetition is not necessarily a bad thing because you want to be, get to the, to the audience. It's like, well, you know, there's, there's still a lot of research going on to this. What we thought we knew 20 years ago is not what we know today. Um, Sometimes that will take up more time just to get all that stuff out there and, and get them on this on the same level of thinking. But I think it's important because the audience needs to know that 
you know, what they see in Hollywood TVs isn't exactly what's going on. Um, but also too, it's like, you know, we, we felt, we thought we knew this and we find some new information, which completely changes everything. This is going to be really fascinating. You want to stay tuned and, and pay attention. Um, so yeah, it's, it's that working the audience and trying to figure out what, what's going to be good for them. Um, it's not, you know, it's not just you. It's not just you talking about what we, we really love. Um, you do want to show some passion for what you're talking about, obviously, and some, some background knowledge that you, that you think you know what you're talking about. Um, you don't want to bore the audience to tears either. And the hardest one is like the mixed audiences, you know, like any age. Because you could have like a five-year-old who's like squirming like crazy. You could have like Grandpa Joe who's falling asleep like two minutes in. And you've got the, the parents in between who are like, who are kind of interested, but they also like, you know, I learned like two sentences of this in my history class 20 years ago. Um, what does this have to do with now? You know, it's like, it, it can get really challenging again. Um, but I kind of like that challenge in, in some ways. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that I would keep reminding myself and I would tell myself that you don't have to be perfect, that your kit doesn't have to be the best possible kit right away it's going to change you know build the basis of a kit get the very basic things that you need and be content with having just those for a little while you know get to know the pieces in your kit do some more research talk with more people network a little bit and then see what you need to change um and don't just change it because somebody told you you know let yourself decide for that you know if you want to change it or not if you find more research great and if you are able to you know adapt your kit fabulous but be patient with yourself and don't expect to be perfect and have to have everything all at once you're in this for the long haul so allow yourself time to you know to be a reenactor and to you know give yourself the freedom to change when you want to don't spend money on that really heavy jousting armor that you know <laughs> that's a good that's what a tip that I, I try i do try to give people is Make sure what you're buying is what you want and what works for your portrayal. I mean, I've spent so much money on stuff that I have either sold for a, a pittance of what it cost me, or I've just thrown away because it ended up just being junk or I've ruined it. It's like I, I bought a Gambeson a few years ago, about 10 years ago now. It was a, one of those cheap, like $99 get dressed for battle 15th mm -hmm. century Gambesons. I wore it to one event and I fought in it once and the armpits ripped out and ripped down the back after fighting in it once and I had to throw it away because it was just junk. And that was $100 that I could have saved and put towards a better gambeson that wouldn't have ripped on me after one use. And, and I see that happen a lot. People, well, I just want to do it. It's like, well, would, do you want to do it or do you want to do it right? So that's, that's, it's, and I've always in the do it right camp and some people are always in the, well, I just want to get out there and do it camp. But spending you know more money on an item now that that you know is the right item and you know is going to last is going to save you that much more money down the road because you don't have to spend it again um i would tell him not to worry so much about trying to make the group grow and not to worry so much about getting spares bucket kit to facilitate other people getting in and instead to focus on a small number of high quality objects and to uh, learn Russian. That, those are probably the main things I, I would recommend. Um, yeah. Um, so when I started, um, and, and to be honest, up until very recently, um, I was I was focused so heavily on, on trying to get the group going that I that I um, probably went a little bit overboard with trying to get enough spare kit that, that if I had, you know, two or three guests coming, there would be spare boots, spare belts, spare tunics, spare swords and daggers, um, which, um, you know, you know, the way to do that is, um, is I, I got a lot of my own stuff from India, from Indian merchants. And um, I mean, the, the quality is not, not awful, but it's also not, particularly good either it's not excellent and it wouldn't live up to the standards that i set for myself now um and i think had i known that actually um going down this you know trying to set up a group and doing events would be a bit of a fruitless endeavor i would have been like you know what just focus on myself and don't worry about getting other people kitted up um you know they can do that if they want to um just focus on getting a good quality um, good quality stuff for myself and learn Russian. And the second one is, if money was no object, what kind of reenacting project would you like to do or 
what would be sort of the ultimate portrayal? Oh, I would love to do, um, if it's Roman, I would love to do some of either the things for Emperor Hadrian, that whole, and the Flavian dynasty, get some upper class women's, the wigs and hair pieces, some of the fine silks and get somebody else to sew them for me because, uh, you know, my ability is not quite there. But um, yeah, I would like to do a whole kit with that. I think that'd be amazing. Um, and then for other time periods, I mean, I, I would just love to be able to get full outfits for a lot of different time periods so that when I go to reenactments, I can kind of experience life in different centuries. So, you know, as many costumes as I can get, as many outfits, so I can get to know the people better. So my idea for, you know, early 8th century Sogdian royal armor has been sitting on the shelf for some years now. And um, it, initially it was shelved on account of, you know, research. And I wanted to find lots of, you know, papers and stuff to back everything up. And now it's being shelved because, shelved because of money, because a lot of the stuff is very fancy. In particular, um, you know, that there's many paintings from Penjikens showing these warriors wearing long coats of lamel armor and the shoulders are decorated. They're like, they're um, embossed metal things in the shapes of animal head, which animal heads, uh, you know, drag into lines or something. Um, and, and I'm sure they must be, you know, gilded um, or, or something, you know, which would be hor- horrendously expensive, but it would look unbelievable when it's done. And um, I, it's not shelved forever. I do plan on doing this at some point um, because I want to publish this one. And it's also definitely the most impressive, you know, aesthetically out of all the Sogdian armors um, that we see in archaeology or art. Um, but it's probably going to be the one that requires the most saving up for. Oh, this is, let me see if I can condense this down because not only have I thought of it, I've actually written it down and redrafted it and redrafted it. If money was absolutely no object, what I think the U S needs is a medieval focus living history playground. That isn't a open air historical uh, interpretation type museum. So we kind of got Camlin village over there on the West coast and it's, the same kind of thing it's it's an open air museum it's very much like a medievally mini colonial williamsburg but what what we need is a place that the reenactment community for medieval living history can go and have a reliable place to do events where the environment is run by someone who understands what the needs and wants of a living history event is and a place that can simultaneously do immersion events and bring the public in and it doesn't necessarily have to be when i say central like it doesn't have to be in the middle of the country though that would be convenient for me of course obviously because i'd love to run this thing but it just needs to be there there is no place that i know of unless there is one and then it's secret and that kind of defeats the purpose but there is no one that i know of where it is a space that isn't also a campground for the rest of the year or it isn't also just some guy's property that when if he rolls his tractor and his son splits up the land you've lost your spot it's not something that's dedicated to something else and we rent it for living history or we happen to have a living history guy that lets us use their property and i don't it doesn't necessarily have to have a castle built on it though it'd be great to have like a couple small cottages or some sort of both a facility that allows you to do impressions on the inside. And that's, again, going off on a tangent. One thing that drives me nuts about living history, the medieval era, is that there is so much impression that we could be doing that's supposed to be done inside that we never get to really do because we're always outside. And we get to see pictures of people in Europe doing it because they can just go to a castle for the weekend. And I just don't happen to have those you know, in the U.S. And so there's shoes, for instance, like if I were to put together a gentry outfit, there are slippers that I would wear inside, not clunky leather turn shoes. They'd be embroidered and they'd look fancy. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to wear those in a field where they're going to get trashed because they're house slippers and there are things that we can do in a facility that is designed to represent the interior of medieval habitats that we at least in america don't get to experience that often so if money was absolutely no issue i would be creating a medieval living history center that is focused on the the living history aspect first obviously 
one of the key aspects of living history, in my opinion, and, and the practice that I do and what I enjoy about it, what I get a lot of feedback, a lot of good feeling out of it, it is interacting with the public. So I want to make it accessible to the public as well, but not in the way that an open air museum is public first, reenactor second. It would be a living history playground that also caters to the public and gives us the opportunity to explore not just the material culture by what we wear, but explore the environment based on period surroundings, period buildings, uh, authentic structures, layouts of a small manor. Like the, uh, think of a tangible aspect, like how can you experience manorialism if you've never been in a manor and seen the small village that erupts around it and things like that. Um, as for my personal impression, obviously I would just ratchet up my gentry impression to the point where, um, I don't know, I blinded people in the sun with my glitz and glamour. But uh, effectively, I would just take what I do already as my minor night impression and take it and turn the dial to 11 and break the knob off. But even even if I didn't get to do that for myself, if I could afford a, to, to seed or create or administrate some sort of medieval living history playground, that would be amazing. I love that idea of an inter inside space that's that's medieval, that can be like modular. So it's not just 15th century, it can be converted to 16th century and 17th century. Um, and it's like, and it's indoors. I love that idea. Oh man, that's great. Um, and I agree. That would be, uh, I have not thought a lot about this. You know, money was no object um, because I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the reverse situation. I have, I have dwindling uh, finances and I'm freaking out about that. But anyway, um, um, but yeah, the, the idea of a place where you can go and it's like, it's not outdoors. You're not underneath the tent in the blazing sun in the summer. Um, you could be in, in, in a, not, not like inside air conditioned, but like, but an internal space that represents the period in, in that context. Yeah. I like that. And you can, you can go from outside space, like, like a village, like into a, like a manor or like, like a half castle or something. Oh yeah. That would be, that would be slick. Um, with Wolf Arjun, we did a little tiny bit of that at Higgins Armory, which, you know, everybody talks about it, like, oh my gosh, it looks like a castle on the inside. Like, well, kind of, sort of. Um, it is modeled after um, a cathedral in in, uh, in uh, Germany, I think. But it's, you know, it's Art Deco. It was built in the 20s. So it's, mm, it's got some problems. But, you know, we would do things like they, they had portable tables. We'd set up tables with like linen uh, tablecloths and um, finery. We had like nice, um, like one or two play sets um, or dinner sets. So we can kind of sort of show that, but to show that on a much grander scale for, for wider context. Um, the, the other, like in, in to kind of branch onto that, um, as I'm thinking on the fly, because like I said, I haven't really thought about, you know, money was no object other than just financial support of the existing like museums and institutions. Um, but on, on like with that, what I, what I like with some museums are trying to do um, is like they have the, the original, like in the case, so you can see it um, and get, get as close as you can to it. But then there are exact replicas that you can handle. Um, there's some some of the places like again Higgins and and uh, what I'm trying to do with museum printing is that open storage concept where you can pull out a drawer of a display case and you can see the objects like right there. But I want to I would love to have it one step further where you can get the replicas out. So you're not too worried obviously about damaging them, um, and you can you can use them. Um, yeah, and that does kind of edge into into some murky territory too. With you know you invite the public in. Then you have to supply them with clothes and historical background. It, it almost, yeah, it starts to become into like Plymouth Plantation, like in the good old days and things like that, where, where people are just like blindsided by this info. So, I mean, you know, obviously it's, it's not, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. But, but I, no, again, I do like that idea of a space where people can hang out. Uh, for my own, yeah, yeah obviously I, I would like to do redo all of my period kits and, um, yeah, kind of like on that selfishness of it, to have, have the space to store it all um, that also has the space to, to maintain it and then to transport it places, um, yeah, to do things like that. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I'd like to do more indoor spaces where it's not blazing hot, wearing wool. I'm, I'm kind of done with that. <laughs> um, and then I guess the other hypothetical question, and speaking of money, you know, if money wasn't, 
an object, what would sort of be your, your dream project or your sort of dream portrayal right now? Uh, dream portrayal, I'd, I'd be, if money wasn't an object, I'd be rocking a full uh, uh, 1415 Henry V uh, white harness with uh you know the, the grand bassinet and everything I'd, I'd have all of that um grand project i'd probably like to start a living history village community uh center uh focusing on a bunch of different eras but i'm actually sort of working on some of my dream projects right now i'm very lucky enough with starting this i mean i've got some real real cool things that we're, we're building the mobile museum exhibit uh that's an amazing project we're working on the app to go along with that um we're we're doing the 3d printed full-size 3d printed effigy project so it's like I'm in a way, I'm in a lot of ways, I'm sort of living my dream right now. It's, it's, I'm amazingly lucky to be able to do it. Um, it it's, I mean, money is still an object. I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to fundraise for these things, but it's still, it's been an amazing opportunity to, to do a lot of this stuff. That's it for our show today. Thanks to all of our guests and thanks to everyone listening. This is Deconstructing History. 